Good afternoon. Welcome to video 17, Mendelian genetics and non-Mendelian genetics with a little bit of math thrown in. Um, the non-Mendelian genetics is what I always call in class breaking Mendel's rules. So, you know, in about seventh grade or maybe before then, I don't, I don't really know, I've never taught below ninth, um, you might learn that big R, big R, red is dominant, let's say, in, uh, I don't know, flower petal colors. And so big R, big R is red and big R, little r is red, and little r, little r is white. Well, that isn't always how it goes. So sometimes we break Mendel's rules. We might have incomplete dominance where big R, big R is red, big R, little r is pink, and little r, little r is white. So we're gonna look at Mendelian genetics and about nine other ways of sort of breaking Mendelian genetics rules. We'll look at a little bit of independent assortment and crossing over and possibly sickle cell. I think we'll probably run out of time before we get to that. By the end of this video, you should be able to be good to go on free response 2017 number three, 2010 number three, and 2018 number seven. Those last two, 2010 number three and 2018 number seven, um, are especially good. Okay, so let's look at just a little bit of vocab really quick. Let's say I've got a phenotype like um, brown eyes. So phenotype means physical characteristics. So that's what we can see. You can tell my phenotype just by looking at me. I can tell my son's phenotype by looking at his eyes. And a phenotype is determined based off of your genotype. We go a different color here. And for the moment, we're gonna pretend that it's just Mendelian genetics. So we'll pretend there's a dominant and a recessive and that's it. So we're gonna say that there's brown eyes and there's blue eyes and nothing else. So these are three possible genotypes for eye color in our pretend world where there's brown and blue and that's it. And so if brown is dominant, then brown eyes, brown eyes, blue eyes. Okay. Blue eyes I get, brown eyes I get, why is that brown eyes? Well, a lot of times when you're looking at genetics and there's like a dominant and a recessive, um, one of them is the actual gene and the other one is a broken gene. So for example, when there's no pigment in your eyes, then light bends, refracts, diffracts, bends and bounces around in there and it appears blue when it comes back out but it's, it's not actually blue, like there's, I mean, it, it's blue because you can, you call it blue, but like it bounces back out and it's, there, there's no pigment in there, it just appears blue. Kind of like when I look at the horizon, like, you know, the air in this room is clear, but when I look at a lot of it um, and the light is bending, it looks blue. I look down in the ocean, light penetrates through, only uh, bib out of Roy G. Bib makes it back out, has enough power to come back out and hit my eye, so the ocean looks blue. I can take my beaker while I'm out on the ocean, because I have beakers out on the ocean, and I scoop it up, I look at it, it looks clear, but the ocean looks blue, or my veins aren't blue, but they look blue, only, only the blue makes it back out. Anyway, my point is this, quick little physics side note there, I probably butchered it some, but my point is this, I might have a gene that codes for brown pigment. I got one from my mom and one from my dad. That's why I'm big B, big B. So imagine that you've got um, birthday cake and you're making a frosting. And so one of the steps says add brown pigment. So this is saying add brown pigment. This is another step saying add brown pigment. So the frosting is gonna be brown. Here, this one says add brown pigment. And this one is supposed to say add back brown pigment, but it's broken. So you add brown pigment. So once again, your frosting is, is brown. Here, both of the genes that code for the steps that say add brown pigment, you're probably not adding pigment, you're probably adding food coloring um, to your, which is pigment, uh, to your cake. And when both of those are broken and you don't add it, then now you just by default have a white frosting cake. Same thing with our eyes. I'm supposed to have genes, two of them, that say add brown pigment. I might have one and I still have brown eyes. And if I do nothing, I get blue eyes. So my genotype will determine my phenotype. We call that homozygous dominant. So they're both the same. Hetero, hetero is different. And then homozygous recessive. And we say zygous because it's a zygote. When a sperm meets an egg, 
um, that first cell is called a zygote. So homozygous, zygote means dad's sperm, if it was homozygous dominant, would be like big B, and mom's egg would be big B, for example. So that's a genotype. And a genotype is made from alleles. I've always heard it pronounced alleles. It looks like it should be alleles. And there might be some parts of the country where they say it that way, but in Oklahoma and Texas, I've only heard alleles. So in this example, there's a capital B, a dominant allele, and a recessive. Those combine to make my genotype. That will determine what you see on the outside, my phenotype. And then all of this occurs at a certain spot on a gene map called a locus. So here's a gene map of flies, for example. And right here, at they, they measure them in map units. That's like their, un, their unit. It's, a, it's kind of like a unitless unit almost. Um, at 57.5 map units, that's where we determine the phenotype for eye color. So we'll look, and it looks like um, there are two different alleles. Looks like you could have a dominant or recessive for red eyes or cinnabar eyes. Those will go together, make my genotype, and determine my eye color. And they were found at this locus. Your body color, is it going to be black or gray if you're a fly, is found at this location on a gene map at 48.5. The reason this matters is later on when we start looking at crossing over and link genes, when traits are really, really close together on the same chromosome, they tend to move with each other, and those are linked genes, and they disobey Mendel's rules. Mendel's rules normally say that genes sort independently. My hair color and my height have nothing to do with each other. They sort independently. Um, my intelligence and my eye color have nothing to do with each other. They sort independently. So I can't go and recruit AP Bio students based off of eye color, like, oh, you've got this eye color, so come take the class, you'll do well, or uh, your eye color, well, you're an idiot. You know, I can tell because your eye color, don't take AP Bio, that type of thing. That doesn't make sense. So most genes we look at um, and they, they sort independently. They're not related at all. But sometimes genes are close to each other on the same chromosome, and so then they, they do kind of travel with each other. So then looking at this gene could predict um, another phenotype. Okay, um, what we wanted to look at next was dominant versus recessive. So you might remember this from class. One, two, three, four, five, six. So six fingers on a hand, six toes on a foot. Um, polydactyl is what it's called, many dactyl digits and kind of like a pterodactyl, their, their wings, um, they look like feathers, teri, and dactyl means like fingers. So if you have six digits on each limb, six, 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 that's actually a dominant trait. Recessive is five, 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 five. Um, one type of dwarfism is actually dominant to um, typical height. So what that means is there's dominant and then there's recessive, but then like, what, what does dominant mean then if it's not the most common? So we've got a different word for that. And you might remember this is the one definition that I make you like write it down my way and memorize it my way. Most of the time, I don't make you memorize a definition a certain way. So dominant means shows up full strength every time. Dominant means shows up full strength every time. So if I get a, um, an allele from mom that's brown and an allele from dad that's orange and I end up having brown eyes, then that means that brown is dominant. If it was this way and this one showed up, that was the phenotype, that would be dominant. Which one's the most common? Well, whatever is most common in nature is called wild type. So it's the type that's most common in the wild. So for example, over here, having six toes on a foot is dominant, but it's not the wild type. The wild type is five, because five is what's most common in nature. 
So that kind of bothers people sometimes. If I know the real definition of dominant, then several of these other things like incomplete dominance and co-dominance make sense. You don't end up flip-flopping them. A lot of students flip-flop because you kind of, you memorize the names and then months later you take the AP bio test and you just kind of flip-flop them in your head. But if I know that dominant means shows up full strength every time, then those definitions will make sense. Okay. Um, the next thing that we want to do before we start breaking Mendel's rules is look at a few examples of Punnett squares. So big A, little a, big B, little b, crossed with big A, big A, big B, little b. So give this one a shot. Actually pause the video and set up this Punnett square. You don't have to fill in every square, just set up what goes across the top and what goes down the side. So go ahead and pause. All right, and we're back. So what we want to do is see what this would look like if I've got big A, little a, big B, little b, crossed with big A, big A, big B, little b. Then I'm going to have a 16 square Punnett square if I'm doing Punnett squares. And we will have the opportunity for a possible shortcut here in a second. And from there, I just kind of think of FOIL and math. I need to look at all the possible combinations. So let's say that this one right here is dad. And this one right here is mom. And we'll put dad over here. So these are dad's sperm. Don't think about it too much. Okay, so the rule is dad can pass on a letter A and a B. Mom will pass on a letter A and a B, assume everything goes as planned. And then the baby will be like big A, little A, big B, little B, or, or whatever combination. I should get an A from mom and an A from dad, a B from mom and a B from dad. So that means I need an A and a B from mom and an A and a B from dad. So in dad's sperm, he's going to pass along one of these combinations. First, outer, inner, last. So that's what I put across my Punnett square. Some students will want to say this. Oops, that's not dad's sperm. Um, and then I would put this down over here maybe, but then if I did that, I know I just flip-flopped mom and dad, but if I did that, then that, that first kid would only have A's and no B's. Maybe A codes for heart and B codes for brain. This kid has no brain. It's like some sort of Wizard of Oz type of thing. So what that means is dad's sperm should pass along a letter A and a B. Same thing with mom's eggs. So we'll put mom's eggs up here. It's an odd thing. We'll put mom's eggs up here. So big A, big B. Big A, little B. Little big. Little little. Same thing across the top with mom. We'll do the same method. First, outer, inner. Last, first, outer, inner, last. From there, I can get the ratio of what my kids will be. Doesn't guarantee that I'm going to have these. This doesn't mean that now I have to have 16 kids. It just means these are the ratios. So if I wanted to know what are the odds that I have a kid that's big A, little A, big B, little B, this can tell me out of 16 what the odds are. Now, you might notice if we were rushed for time, that um, I don't have to fill out all of this Punnett square. That, 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 and that are all unique. So I have one of these for every one of these, for every one of these, for every one of these. So I have a one to one to one to one ratio. In math, I can't reduce that at all. Over here, I've got two of these. Big A, big B's, and I've got two of these. Big A, little b's. So there I have a 2 to 2 ratio. I can reduce that in math. So I can reduce that down to 1 to 1. So that means I only need one of the A, B's, one of the big A, big B's. And I need only one of the big A, little B's. So if I was in a rush, I don't need to fill out that column or that column. I just need this. So from there, I can figure out my ratios. And I'm not going to work that for you. I guess I can put one of them in there. Like this would be big A, big A, big B, little b. You normally go alphabetical. So A's go in front. And then within the letters, 
Um, once I'm within the B's, capitals go before lowercase. All right, so I could work a problem like that. Great. But what if I get into something that's a little bit more tricky, something that's bigger? Like this one. What if that's mom, that's dad, and I want to know, I don't need like, you know, some giant insane Punnett square. I want to know what are the odds that I have a kid that is this? So give that a shot. I'm gonna give this a real quick spray. And then we'll work it up on the board. Okay, so in this one, if I start trying to do Punnett squares with all possible combinations, big A with big B with big C with little d, Big A with little b with big C with little d. Big A with little b with little c. With, you know, like it, it's going to get like pretty out of control. So there has to be a quicker way. So if I have this. You'll notice my lowercase c's look different. That's just because when I start writing, if I go like this is capital and that's lowercase, I start getting confused as to telling like what's actually upper and what's actually lowercase. Uh, yeah, I'll keep going the same color. And I want to know what are the odds of big, big, little, little. All right, so again, um, give this one a shot and we'll come back and work it. All right, here we go. So according to independent assortment, A's are going to give me a result regardless of what B's and C's and D's do. So now I just have to calculate what are the odds that I get a big A, big A? Well, 50%. There's two ways I can do that. One, I can just think in my head, all right, from dad, what are the odds that I get a capital A from dad? 100%. I'm either going to get a big A or a big A, so 100%. All right, so 100%. What are the odds that I get a big A from mom? 50%. So, you know, um, one 100% right there guaranteed, that means it's 50 50. If, if I want to think of it like this, like a little Punnett square, then there you go. What are the odds that I get big A, big A? Two out of four, fifty percent. So the odds of big A, big A, one half. Next up, what are the odds that I get little b, little b from these parents? Twenty-five percent. Why? Same thing. I did a uh, Punnett square in my head. What are the odds that I get little b, little b? One fourth, twenty-five percent. I started fresh, and so I'll stay with them. Next up, what are the odds that I get big C, little c? Right there, I'm guaranteed to get a little c, right? So that one's a sure thing. What are the odds that that c is a capital C? 50-50. So, one half. Again, if you want to see it in Punnett square form, I have that Punnett square and that Punnett square. What are the odds that I'm big C, little c? Two out of four, 50-50. And then lastly, what about big D, little d? Well, I have to get a capital D from dad. I have to get a little d from mom, so it's guaranteed. It's 100%, one out of one. So what are the odds that these two parents have that specific kid? I just multiply across the top. One times one times one times one. And then two times four is eight, times two is 16, times one is 16. So there's a one in 16 chance um, on the real AP bio test, you can, unless they were to ask for decimals or something like that, you can either leave things as fractions or throw them into a calculator and give a decimal. So if an answer was one fourth, you can say one fourth, or you can say 25%. Um, with, when you get into something like one sixteenth, because I don't want to keep all the digits to the right, this is a perfect number. Like it's, uh, I hate to use that word, but like um, I'm not rounding if I say one sixteenth. Okay, so that's how I can do bigger Punnett squares. The next thing we want to look at is um, 
this way or several ways of breaking Mendel's rules. So the first one is incomplete dominance. This one you learned possibly in seventh grade, definitely in ninth grade. Same thing with co-dominance. And so the way that it works is it's based off of this name right here, incomplete dominance. Dominant means shows up full strength every time. So incomplete dominance means apparently they don't. So if I had this, and let's say that I knew big R was dominant, red, and little r was recessive, white, and flowers. That's red, that's white. According to regular Mendelian genetics, big R, big R, or I'm sorry, big R, little r, would be red. So Mendel would say, this phenotype is red. Incomplete dominance, co-dominance. Incomplete dominance means it's incomplete that somebody shows up full strength every time. So red doesn't show up full strength, white doesn't show up full strength. So what does that mean? You get an intermediate, like pink. What would co-dominance mean? That means co is both, like cooperate, um, co-ed functions. So that means both show up full strength every time. So that would mean that you are red and white. So I could be a red flower, a pink flower. I could maybe have like red with white streaks or something like that. Sometimes students will say, well, isn't pink the same thing as red and white? No, um, the American flag has red and white stripes. It's not a pink flag, that's different. A pink shirt is different from a red and white striped shirt. All right, so, done, done, done. Next up, environmental effects. Basically, in, um, now that we've looked at molecular genetics, this is a type of epigenetics. So I've got this fox, and when it's wintry outside, light-colored fur. Um, when the snow melts, dark-colored fur. How's that possible in the same fox? Well, essentially proteins turn on and turn off based off of temperature. So its genes are the same. Its code of A, T, G, and C are the same. It's just when they're on and when they're off is temperature dependent. So the environment can help to turn genes on and turn genes off. It kind of makes sense if, if I've been eating in three days, I'm going to have a whole lot of genes that are on that say like, hey, break down muscle, break down fat, um, you know, just, just try to not die. Whereas if I've, you know, been eating three or 4,000 calories um, every day, then now I'm going to be in like storage mode. I'm going to be in anabolic mode instead of cat catabolic mode. So it makes sense that like things from the environment can tell me to turn genes on and turn genes off. Another example of that was Siamese cats. When they're born, they're all white. And um, then as, as they're outside of, the, outside of mom's womb, that's because they're warm everywhere. But um, once they're born, tails, paws, ears, they call it pointing, I think, um, start to turn black. And that's again because the genes that code for dark pigment are actually off when it's warm and on when it's cold. That's kind of the opposite of the Arctic fox and Arctic hare or rabbit. Um, they are, when it's cold, the genes are off, so they have white fur. These guys are opposite, so where it's warmest, um, they have the lightest colors, and where it's cold, you know, like on your ears, your fingertips, your toes, your nose, um, that's their equivalent. I know we don't have a tail. I mean, we have a tailbone, but you get the idea. Um, next up, multiple alleles. Environmental effects. Multiple alleles. Um, so they use the word multiple. Normally you have two alleles. I realize technically that qualifies as multiple, but in genetics, multiple alleles means that you have three or more. So if you typically just have two, then all right, fine. But let's say that you've got something like blood types. Now I've got three alleles. I've got A, I've got B, and I've also got a recessive O. Blood types are weird because they're also codominant. So for example, Let's say these are my red blood cells. That's blood type A. I have these proteins on there that they just named A. That's B. But if I have both of them, if I'm like a cat bear, then I'm AB. And if I got nothing, I'm blood type O. 
Blood types are actually more complicated than that. There are other proteins like RH factor that they discovered in the rhesus monkey. No relation to the peanut butter cup. It's RH rhesus. So rhesus um, monkeys, RH factor. If you're positive for it, that means you've got it. So if this was like O positive, then I'd like have the RH protein. So there are other proteins. It's not really that red blood cells have zero other proteins. It's just that your immune system gets really pissy um, about certain ones that have to match up. So that's multiple alleles. You've got more than, more than just two. So blood types, you could say, are multiple alleles. And you could also say codominant because when I have A and B, they both show up full strength. My favorite way of breaking Mendel's rules, pleiotropy. Remember, 40% of cats with blue eyes and white fur are also deaf. So pleiotropy is... Um, let's see, I'll fit this right up here. Pleiotropy is one gene that's supposed to be a, a G, I didn't help at all. Uh, one gene codes for multiple phenotypes. So phenotype A, phenotype B, and phenotype C. And some of them might seem like a cheater phenotype. For example, my hair color, my eye color, my skin color, the darkness, the brownness, or tan, whatever you want to call it, um, is all coming from melanin. So basically, if I had zero melanin, then that would affect my, my hair color, my eye color, and my skin color. But you're like, yeah. Yeah, I get that those are three different phenotypes, but they're all from the same thing. So that's, that's kind of crap. But you wouldn't have thought eye color, hair color, and then deafness. So it turns out that the gene that codes for um, deposition of pigment is also related to a gene responsible for hearing. In um, babies, in human babies, whenever a baby is born deaf, there's a gene that codes for a particular type of ion channel in their ears, and that's also found in their kidneys. So if I'm an infant and I'm born deaf, I might be deaf for one of these like 20 reasons. But if it's reason number seven, and that's that this particular ion channel is messed up, then my kidney function is also messed up. Now, it could be reason number one, and then my kidneys are fine. So when you're deaf, you aren't guaranteed to have messed up kidneys. But again, if I'm deaf because of this reason right here, then kidney function is also messed up. You'd have never thought that kidney function, the renal system, the urinary system, would have anything to do with the nervous system, my special senses, hearing. So that's pleiotropy, when one gene elicits multiple different phenotypes. Another example of pleiotropy were the mice that we saw, the agouti mice that we saw in the molecular genetics videos. This guy has kind of the agouti color fur, whatever color you want to call it. In a lab we say that that's an agouti mouse, so orange. And so he's going to be overweight, and because he's so overweight he's also going to have diabetes. This is an average mouse, um, so he has dark fur, so he's got average weight and he's less likely to have diabetes. All right, that was pleiotropy. Next up, epistasis. So epistasis will explain Labradors. Um, on a molecular kind of, or from a molecular kind of view, you know how we were looking at signal transduction when protein A activates protein B, activates protein C, activates protein D? Well, if I have like this line of events, Protein A activates protein B, which activates C, which activates D, which has some sort of response. Well, what if my gene that codes for protein B is messed up? Everything shuts down, no response. What if C is messed up? Same result, everything shuts down, no response. What if D is messed up? Same thing, no response. That's epistasis. Epistasis is where you have many genes but they're actually dependent on each other. So kind of like with Labradors. So with Labradors, B codes for black pigment. Um, little B, they don't tell me up here. Um, little B is brown, we call those chocolate labs. Big E, this is a totally different locus. Um, so this is like a totally different gene, like this might be located on chromosome 4 on dogs, and the E gene might be located on chromosome 7 or something. Kind 
capital E, codes for deposit pigment. Little e is broken. Okay, so what that means is this. If I have a dog that is capital B anything, and then capital E anything, that's going to be a black lab. Because it's making black pigment, and because of capital E, it is passing, it is depositing that pigment. If I have um, little b, little b, a capital E in anything, well now, that means I'm going to have brown pigment, so I'm going to be chocolate in color, and I have to have a capital E. That means I deposit my brown pigment, so I'm going to be a chocolate lab. Um, those seem, I haven't read this anywhere, but those seem less common. I see a lot more um, yellow labs and chocolate labs. And then, of course, at the very end, it doesn't matter what I have over here. If I've got little e, little e, I'm not depositing pigment. Oh, you've got black, I don't care, I'm not putting it in there. Oh, you've got brown, I don't care, I'm not putting that in there. So then you have a yellow lab. So what that means is like, you know, technically if I was big B, big B, little e, little e, my fur color is supposed to be black and I can make black pigment. We just don't stick it into my fur. So maybe, and I haven't researched this, a lot of things are way more complicated, um, so it's not going to be this easy, but you could start looking at somebody that has dark hair and light eyes. Well, if you have like black hair, then that means your body does code for melanin. You can make melanin, but then, and then there's a gene that says, put it in my hair and your body's like, okay. So there's a gene that codes for black hair or black pigment. And it says, put it in my, there's a gene that says, put it in my hair. What about my eyes? Well, I still have the code for black pigment, but the gene that says put it in my eyes is not there, and so that's why I would have blue eyes. So eye color can be epistasis. Eye color, there is still dominant and recessive, like brown eyes is dominant to blue, so it still is Mendelian genetics. It's also co-dominant. You might have brown eyes with chunks of green, or you might have blue eyes with that little like kind of yellow sunburst thing going in the middle. So eye color is also co-dominant, so eye color gets tricky. Um, so that was epistasis. Polygenic, many genes. You're like, wait a second, wasn't epistasis many genes? Yeah, but with, let me get rid of this. At school I have a bigger board. This is all I could get on Craigslist. Um, so with polygenic, it's still many genes, just like epistasis, and so there's some sort of outcome, like dark fur, but now they're additive. So it's almost like, back to my recipe analogy, um, pretend that I've got a white cake, white frosting cake, and I've got four instructions that says, put in a drop of brown pigment, put in a drop of brown pigment, put in a drop of brown, put in a drop of brown. Well, if all four of those genes say put in drops of brown pigment, then the icing will be really dark brown. What if one of them is broken? Now I have three drops, so it's less brown. What if two of those genes are broken? Well, now I put in two drops, so now it's less brown. This is how we get kind of the shades of human skin color. So it's not quite this simple, um, but for skin color, there are six six spots, six alleles in total that you'll inherit. Um, you'll inherit a set of A's for mom and dad, a set of B's and a set of C's. And so let's just pretend that they're all dominant. Um, I believe they actually are. Then if I get big A, big A, big B, big D, big C, big C, then I put in, you know, kind of like, it's like putting in six drops of pigment so I'll have the darkest skin. If I have five of the dominant or four or three or two or one, then my skin is lighter and lighter and lighter. And you can see examples in these pictures. So here's the lightest guy, blonde hair, blue eyes, etc. He has all recessives. This guy has one dominant, this guy has two dominants, three dominants, and so forth. And so you eventually get to all the various shades of skin color. Now, another thing that you'll notice is that sometimes one gene does predict another gene. So true, the likelihood that I can predict whether or not you're intelligent based off of your hair color or your eye color 
is going to be just up to random chance. So I'm not going to be able to do any better than random chance because there is no link. However, some things are linked. Some genes are linked. They are close to each other on the same chromosome. So for example, um, if I was just looking with observations and if there really were multiple loci, then um, for all the genes that code for hair and eye and skin color, it would look like this. Basically, if you have red hair, what are the odds that I can guess your eye color? And let's just say that there's three eye colors, brown, green, blue, um, or we can keep it even simpler, just brown and blue. So you have red hair. Odds are, if it's just random guessing, I've got a 50-50 shot of guessing your eye color, but I bet I can guess it and I bet it's blue. And I bet you have fair skin and a lot of freckles because you're Irish. If you have really dark hair, you probably have dark eyes. There are exceptions, but about nine times out of 10, if you have hair that we would consider to be black, um, worldwide, it's way more than nine times out of 10, you have dark colored eyes. So genes can um, be linked. Linked is when one affects the other. So if I'm doing a Punnett square, and my regular old Punnett square says something like, I expect three to one, like pretend that I have something like this. And I'm like, all right, I expect uh, three brown-eyed kids and one blue-eyed kid. When you start getting into linked genes, then all of a sudden you might have 100 people. And instead of expecting, you know, like 75 and 25, you end up getting like 95 and, and 5. Um, I've got all these blonde-haired people and I expect this amount to have brown eyes or something. So when you start doing a Punnett square and you get something vastly different from a Punnett square, it might be that the genes are linked. Could be epistasis, could be, you know, something else, but it might be that you have linked genes. If the linked genes are on sex chromosomes, then now you have sex-linked traits. So you might remember. The Y chromosome doesn't have a whole lot of genes on it. And the only thing that um, Y chromosome genes can code for are things that make males different from females. Y chromosomes can't be necessary for life because otherwise all females would be, you know, non-living. Um, so Y chromosomes are necessary um, to convert male, you know, originally when, when sperm meets egg and you're a zygote, then you're going down the pathway of becoming a female. And then whenever the Y genes turn on and start releasing hits of testosterone, then like male anatomy um, starts to form in place of female anatomy. You, you were going to go this way with female anatomy and these genes turn on and they're like, nope, we're gonna redirect that and turn that into male anatomy. So like female and male reproductive structures, if I had like a, a crotch shot of both, I could be like that in a female is that in a male. Those in females like ovaries are those, testes in males, ovaries, with cords, they just drop outside the body, testicles with vast deferens, cords. Um, so we can basically see the homologies between the two. Okay, so back to this. My point is, when we start talking about diseases and stuff like that, um, if somebody has some sort of major kidney problem or something like that, that's gonna be carried on the X chromosome and not the Y. Because otherwise, again, all females would have messed up kidneys. So the general rule is this. If I'm looking at a crowd and um, I'm looking for some disease, and let's say that 20 people have the disease, if nine of them are males and 11 are females, it's probably not sex-linked. If 19 of them are males and one is a female, it's probably sex-linked. Now let's say that I don't have a crowd that big. Let's say I have a crowd of 500 and it's 490 are male and 10 or female, something like that. You start getting into bigger, bigger numbers, you're more sure of your data. So the way that we can make our experiments um, a little bit more trustworthy is to repeat over and over and over again. So let's say that um, I've got a trait and it's sex linked and it's more common in males like red, green, color blindness. So I survey a class and a class of 30 males I'll typically have about one male that's red, green, colorblind. If I grab 100 females and um, 
you know, I check to see if they're, they're red, green, color blind. None of them are. But if I grab 100 males, about three of them are. So is it dominant or recessive? It's more common in males. Is it a dominant or recessive disease? So take just a second. Give it a shot. All right. So let's say that um, I've got a recessive, like uh, we'll say capital N is normal vision. Little n is colorblind vision. And about one out of 30 of the letter n's out there are little n's. And that means about 29 out of 30 are capital n's. All right, so males, you just draw one letter n. What are the odds that you get a little n? One in 30. So if you get a little n, you're colorblind. What are the odds of that? One in 30. For a female, what are the odds that you get a little n on that letter x? One in 30. All right? But if you then got a capital N, you're good to go, right? You're not red, green, colorblind. So what are the odds that you get a little n on this x? One in 30. What are the odds that you get two little n's? One in 30 times one in 30. So one in 900. So if something's recessive and it's sex-linked, it should be more common in males. A lot more common, right? Our average class size is about 35-ish, 36. Um, so if I've got 36 students and let's say that half are male, 18 of them, then every other classroom should have a colorblind male. Right? I've got 18. The class next door has 18 males. One of them should be colorblind. Our senior class does not have 900 students in it. Let's say that it's got 750 students, 800 students, you know? So let's say it's 800 students. It's actually smaller than that. Um, let's say it's 800 students, 400 are girls. So in the senior class, there shouldn't be a colorblind girl. In the junior class, let's say there's 800. There should be 400 girls. So between the senior and the junior class, there should be 800 girls. Now we're getting close. We might be able to find a colorblind girl. So every other classroom at Timber Creek should have a colorblind male. But between the freshman and senior class, we might have two red-green colorblind females, statistically, is what we would expect, somewhere around two. You know, one point something, but high and close to two. The last thing that I wanted to mention is, actually, let me check my time on the phone here. Yeah, we'll close out with this, is don't forget, whenever we're doing Punnett squares again, one side is dad, that's coming from dad's sperm. One side is mom, coming from mom's eggs. And that happened through the process of meiosis. Mitosis is when we make copies of cells. Meiosis is when we're making sex cells. So pretend that you have this, only instead of that saying mitosis, it says meiosis. In mitosis, I have a chromosome one from dad, a chromosome one from mom. I go through the S phase. I join at the centromeres. It makes sister chromatids. I go through G2 and mitosis. I line up in the middle metaphase, pull apart, have two identical cells, done. I started with this, and then I end with two identical cells. In meiosis, I split again, but there's a difference. In meiosis, I start with a chromosome one from dad, a chromosome one from mom. I line up as sister chromatids, and by the time I can see this, They've actually lined up side by side and done crossing over in prophase one. So as they line up, they don't line up head over heels, they line up side by side and they start exchanging DNA. So let me show you that one more time. In mitosis, we line up head over heels with our sister chromatids and separate. So now we'll be identical. But in meiosis, we line up side by side one, two, three, four chromatids. They call that a tetrad. A tetra means four. While they're lining up side by side, we'll be able to see that crossing over happened. So are any of these pens identical anymore? Nope. So then we separate and we separate again. And because of crossing over, that's, we've got four cells, four of dad's sperm here, and they're all unique. If this was a female, they'd all be eggs. And you know, these would be mom's eggs. In addition, Whatever chromosome ones are doing, 
I know I don't have double colors of everything. Yep, I don't. Um, in addition, whatever chromosome 1s are doing have no effect on chromosome 2s. So if chromosome 1s line up this way, and chromosome 2s line up this way, then that means going that way, this cell's going to get a red and an orange. But if I lined up this way instead, then now the cell coming towards me would get a red and a purple. So ones and twos sort independently. These guys have nothing to do with these guys. That's why hair color doesn't have much to do with intelligence. By the way, intelligence is more than just one gene, right? So intelligence is complicated. All right, um, make sure you try these, especially these last two. Again, 2017 number three is good, but 2010 number three and 2018 number seven are really good. Um, I think that's about it. Oh, one last thing. I had dots on these originally because College Board, if you look at old tests, of course you need Mendelian genetics, so that's usually on the test. And then linked and sex linked are their favorite ones out of these. So pleiotropy, you don't really see too much, uh, but linked genes and sex linked genes matter a lot. So again, if I'm looking at like a, um, like a pedigree and I notice in the pedigree that all the males are getting the disease, a bunch of males, you know, like, 10 to 1 males, I'm like, ah, then that's probably sex-linked recessive. If in my pedigree it seems like all the females, you know, are largely 10 to 1 getting the disease, then that's probably sex-linked and it's dominant. If in my pedigree, um, you know, 55% of those that have the disease are male and 45 are female or vice versa, that's probably not sex-linked at all. That looks like that has, that's not carried on the X or Y chromosomes. If it's not carried on the sex chromosomes,